everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Mel, I'm an Uruguayan neuroscientist and on the side of my PhD I have this YouTube channel in which I interview scientists from all over the world, sometimes in Spanish and sometimes in English. And today we have a very exciting topic, the female brain and behavior. And for that we have a fellow YouTuber and neuroscientist from the US. Her name is Morgan and her YouTube account is Ask a Neuroscientist in which she uploads very cool content about different aspects of neuroscience. And she's also a PhD student and she wants to understand the female brain because both in health and disease the mechanisms can be different for some things. They are not always translatable, but a lot of research is done in male subjects. And so she wants to contribute to this lack of information, which I think is amazing. So thank you, Morgan, for being here with us. Welcome. I really appreciate that you're here. This is such a cool topic. Hi, thank you so much for having me on your channel. I'm super excited to be doing this. So to start, tell us a bit about your story. Uh, I'm from the United States of America, so everything that I mentioned will have happened here. And I started doing research whenever I was 17, working in a lab at the University of Oklahoma, studying traumatic brain injuries. And then I did my undergraduate degrees at Oklahoma State University, and there I double majored in integrative biology and physiology. So that just goes to show that you don't have to major in neuroscience to be a neuroscientist. Um, while I was there, I worked in a lab studying oxytocin which is commonly known as the love hormone and I studied its relationship to monogamy and then after getting my undergraduate degrees I went on to be a research tech for a year again at the University of Oklahoma where I studied microbleeds which are kind of similar to a stroke but a lot smaller in the brain and then lastly now I'm doing my graduate degree working on my PhD at the University of Texas at San Antonio studying how oxytocin and dopamine influence motivation and behavior in female brains. Wow, fascinating. And why did you choose to specialize on this? So neuroscience is a really broad field, but I've chosen to specialize in women specifically for a few reasons. So first of all, I am a woman and I would really like to know more about my own brain. That's sort of my selfish reason of getting into studying females, but also females are historically understudied and there's a huge lack in literature on just the female brain in general and just how it normally functions. This is really important because there's a lot of diseases and mental illnesses that affect women differently than men and I'm sure we'll get around to talking about that later. And then lastly I wanted to study oxytocin in female brains specifically because I think it's a big area of the field where our biases really show through. So oxytocin was first discovered for its role in the birthing process. The word oxytocin actually is derived from the Greek word meaning swift birth and and that's sort of the first area where we really acknowledged it. Oxytocin is very important in both the act of giving birth as well as feeding the young and also raising the young. So that's sort of what we really focused on in the beginning. Since then, our focus on oxytocin has really been focused on female brains, but it's present in males as well. But most studies with males and oxytocin focus on mate choice because it is also involved in our um, choice of who we partner with. But what I believe and what many others in the field believe is that oxytocin has a role outside of being involved in the birthing process or outside of mate choice. But I think because we are so hung up on its role in the birthing process and women's roles in the birthing process that we can't really move past that in order to study other potential roles of oxytocin. So that's something that I'm really excited to do with my research. That's a very good point. And within that, what do you do? Right now I'm really focused on this project involving stress enhanced reward learning, which is a really interesting concept. So to give an example of this, say a university student is walking to their class and on their way to the class, they nearly get hit by a bus. So they're much more likely to remember the events of that class and the events of the day because this stressful experience has happened to them. And this is something that's been demonstrated in male rats before, but it hasn't necessarily been shown in female rats. So for the rest of this interview, please keep in mind that I study rats. And so extrapolating these things to humans completely 
can lead us down some dangerous paths, so I'm talking about rats. But in male rats, we've seen that a single stressful experience can actually enhance their ability to learn something, but this hasn't been studied in females yet. So I'm really hoping to utilize that background of this happening in male rats and see if the same thing happens to female rats. There have been studies in the past that have shown that female rats actually learn differently than male rats, so it will be really interesting to see if we get the same results with them. And while I'm doing these experiments, I'm also going to be altering the levels of oxytocin within these female mice, which I believe will alter their ability to learn by either enhancing it with more oxytocin or decreasing it with less oxytocin. Very interesting. And could you share with us some results or interesting fact about this? Yes, I'm so happy that you asked that. There's actually a lot of really interesting research being done right now by other researchers like myself who recognize the need for more research on female subjects. Something that I think is really interesting that I've read about is that the female hormonal cycle in rats can affect their motivation. So actually during different periods of their hormonal cycle, they either be less motivated or more motivated depending on which part of the hormonal cycle they're on. But what's really interesting, I believe, is that their motivation level is never less than a male's rat. So if you compare a female rat to a male rat, at any point in the cycle, they'll be equal to or more motivated than the male rat, but they'll never be less motivated than the male rat. And this is part of the reason why I'm so interested in studying oxytocin specifically, because oxytocin fluctuates with the hormonal cycle, and so does dopamine. And so with these changes in motivation, there are also changes in oxytocin and dopamine and throughout this cycle, which is something that I'm really hoping to see in my own research. This is so cool and I also liked that you mentioned that at, at no point the motivation was lower than the one seen in males because there's this rumor or misconception that because we are such uh, unstable hormonal beings or whatever somehow this makes us less productive, less hardworking, less efficient or something compared to male workers and it's good to have research that actually demystifies this kind of stuff. Yes, I mean, there are things that fluctuate and this can have an effect on us, but not necessarily as something so negative. And especially when people generalize and say like women, you know, also women function differently, that there's different types of women, there are different mechanisms or conditions or diseases that women can have and males as well. Yeah, so like I said earlier, I think it's really important that we study females because they are historically understudied. And this can be really dangerous for several reasons, but I'll talk about the two main ones that I think of. So the first thing is that because we don't study females often enough, males are often seen as the default. So if a female behaves differently from a male, it's not seen as necessarily like, oh, well, females' brains work differently than males, is that females are weird. Females are strange. They're abnormal. This is also where we get the concept of females being too hormonal. Males and females have fluctuations in their hormonal cycle, but because we see the male hormonal cycle as the default and as the norm, then we see the female hormonal cycle as too hormonal or strange. And this can be harmful to men too. There's been recent studies that showed that males have a hormonal cycle that's dependent on testosterone that we really haven't studied because of this view of males as not being hormonal. So there's really interesting research that's happening on that now, but it should have been happening a long time ago. We've known about the female hormonal cycle for centuries, but we're just now finding out about the males. The second thing is that understudying females can lead to real world consequences and can actually be seriously dangerous to our mental and physical health. There are a lot of diseases and mental illnesses that present differently in females than they do in males. And if we don't study the females, we're not going to know how to identify those and we're not going to know how to properly treat those. One classic example of this is the heart attack. Females display different symptoms of a heart attack than males do. And because of that, there are doctors to this day who cannot recognize a female's heart attack. And I can't imagine how many lives we may have lost due to that. There's also been recent studies that show that women experience addiction and treatment for addiction differently than men. So this can be a huge problem whenever you're trying to treat someone for their addiction. If you don't know how that addiction is affecting them or how it's presenting in them, you won't be able to properly help them. And then the example that I think is most relevant to my research is that women and men experience and display symptoms of depression and anxiety differently. And this in women can be seen in some ways to be directly tied to our hormonal cycle. So if we don't properly understand how our hormonal cycle and how dopamine are affecting our brains, 
we will never know how to properly treat women for addiction and anxiety. So just to sort of like wrap that all up, I think it's very important to study females and males equally, but historically females have been extremely understudied and that's why I'm so excited to be part of increasing our knowledge of the female brain. Wow, I'm so on board with all of this. I would invite you to a cafe to keep talking about your research because really it's really, really interesting and it's really nice that you're doing this. Like, good for you, good for all of us. <laughs> And this brings me back to your YouTube channel, actually. Like if people want to, you know, stay connected and learn from you all these nice things or even other neuroscience related things, uh, where can they find you? What kind of content do you post? Yes, I do have a YouTube channel. Thank you so much for asking. It's called Ask a Neuroscientist. I post new videos every Wednesday. I sometimes explain different concepts in neuroscience or some neuroscience history. And recently I've been doing quite a few reaction videos. So there's all sorts of different content on my channel. And it's for the most part all PG-13, so it can be shared with any science lover out there. Great, I invite you all to subscribe to Morgan's YouTube channel then. And I'm particularly interested in checking out the one about zombies. Oh my God. Uh, check out this cute little brain flashy. I love it. I want one. It's so cute. <clears throat> Coming back, uh, we might have students watching us right now. So do you have any piece of advice, tips that you would like to give to them? Yes, my biggest piece of advice to people who are interested in research or in science of any sort is please, please get involved in research as early as possible. It's kind of rare for someone to start off in high school like I did, but once you get to your undergraduate university or your college, you really need to seek out research opportunities. And it's not as difficult as people think. People always think it's this big, like daunting task to approach a researcher and like ask to join their lab, but it's not. I swear to you, we are all massive nerds. If you show any amount of interest in our project, we will talk to you for hours and we'll work on recruiting you to our lab. So all you have to do is approach someone who's doing research that you're interested in, tell them that you're interested in their research, and then they will try to take you into their lab. Maybe offer yourself up, like say I'm interested in volunteering in your lab, but I promise you will find at least one professor who is interested in having you in their lab as well. And that doesn't just apply to people who are interested in research. If you're interested in med school, vet school, dental school, any professional school like that in the sciences, they all really appreciate a background in research. If you can even just say that you've done a year's worth of research, you will be a better candidate for all of those opportunities as well. That's great advice. And those are all the questions that I have for you for today. So thank you so much, Morgan, for being here with us. It's really cool all what you're doing and keep it up, keep up the good work and see you around. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on your channel. This has been super fun. I really enjoyed doing it and thank you. Bye. And thank you for your attention. If you liked the video, I invite you to subscribe to the channel, to give a thumbs up, to leave a supporting comment if you have any suggestions of topics that you would like to see. I also have a Patreon account if you would like to support financially with a little donation every month. This goes to make more videos, especially in Spanish for Latin American communities, so it's really cool. And don't forget to check out the other videos in the channel, maybe you missed something that is really cool and you would like to watch, and see you in the next video. Bye bye!